Well, I am, uh, I'm glad that y'all are able to join us this evening. Um, with it being Women's History Month, I thought it was important that we um, create a space to talk about um, what I consider to be a very pressing issue, um, not only for women's health, but I think the health of uh, people throughout the nation. Um, I, I keep coming across news stories of um, doctors who are leaving uh, the state of Idaho, for example. 30% uh, of OBGYNs have left the state because of unfavorable conditions. Um, or then most recently with the IVF uh, problem in Alabama and how people who were waiting to grow their family through that means now find themselves stuck in this middle. And so um, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Fabiola could come and join us. Um, Fabiola Carrion is the Director of Reproductive and Sexual Health at the National Health Law program. She and her team work to ensure that reproductive health services are accessible to everyone with dignity and without cost. Before joining uh, the group, uh, Fabiola was an advocacy program officer at Planned Parenthood Global, where she designed, developed, and oversaw projects on sexual and reproductive rights in Latin America that have resulted in some of the most progressive policies in the region. Fabiola serves on various boards of reproductive freedom organization and is a proud immigrant and Angelina. And so would you join me in welcoming Fabiola Carrion? Thank you. So Fabiola, as we begin our conversation, um, I, I think it's important for us to understand how we got to this point, that after mm -hmm. 50 years of Roe being the law of the land, we find ourselves now two years into that's not the case. And so can you kind of share with us a little bit of that history as we prepare to go forward? I'm sure happy to, and thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, yeah, I, I, wanna, I wanna ground us on how we got here and the fact that uh, the DOPS versus Jackson Women's Health Organization didn't happen out of the blue or in a vacuum. So if you would allow me, I want to go through the history of what abortion has been in this country and frankly in the rest of the world. So abortion has always existed, will always exist, exists now, whether it's legal or it's not. It has, it happens all throughout the world. I've had the opportunity to work on this advocacy um, really in Latin America with advocates in Africa and in Asia, and no one ever said abortion does not exist in my country. <laughs> so um, abortion is certainly something that has is part of the history of humankind. Abortion was part of general healthcare practices since the founding of this country. And it was not until the 1800s that a group of doctors who felt threatened by midwives and healers, principally uh, black women, that they felt that they needed to criminalize abortion. And it's really then, hundreds of years later since the country's founding, that they started um, penalizing people that offered abortions. Uh, then fast forward, the civil rights movement happens and feminists, get, um, you know, build this conscious that they also wanted to be equal and that access to reproductive rights was really critical in order to be a full person that could have can do essentially whatever they want, be the best person that they wanted to be. So in the 1970s, a lot, you know, before Roe v. Wade in 1973, a lot of states, including California, including New York, were um, uh, uh, making abortion legal, making abortion legal under certain circumstances. And in 1973, finally, the U.S. Supreme Court, through Roe v. Wade, said that um, the right to abortion is protected by the Constitution. So we have that in 1973, almost, uh, or you know, more than 50 years ago, and the very anti-abortion conservative movement starts um, rallying up very quickly. And one of the first things they do is through this Congress member by the name of Henry Hyde, he says that he wants to do everything in his power to deny women the right to abortion. And I, I'm gonna look at my papers to make sure that I look at this quote and I get it right. So Congress member Henry Hyde said, I certainly would like to prevent, if I could legally, anybody having an abortion, a rich woman, a middle-class woman, or a poor woman. Unfortunately, the only vehicle I have is the Medicaid bill. 
So what Henry Hyde does in 1973, in 1976, three years after Roe v. Wade is held, is he creates, he introduces in Congress this appropriations bill rider known by the Hyde Amendment. And the Hyde Amendment uh, prohibits federal funding of abortion in healthcare programs like Medicaid, like Medicare, et cetera. And what they do is, and this is an example of first how we see restrictions. We saw restrictions first among poor women, disproportionately women of color, black women, brown women. To give you an example of who was the first victim of the Hyde Amendment, it's this 20-something-year-old college student by the name of Rosie Jimenez from Texas, a Chicana woman, a Mexican-American woman who has to go to Mexico and have an abortion, which at that point was unsafe, and she dies. And why does she do that? Because she's on Medicaid and she cannot have access to a healthcare coverage just like any other healthcare service that used to be, that is covered by Medicaid. So because we have this federal prohibition on abortion payments, then states quickly go on to restrict access to abortions for Medicaid recipients, that is, low-income people. Um, however, the federal government does allow states to move forward on their own and allow coverage for some Medicaid recipients, and some states do that. California is one of them. So the Hatt Amendment sort of starts this wave of anti-choice legislation that is being introduced at the state level way before Dobbs. So again, Dobbs is not something that just happened magically. There were more than 500 straight restrictions on abortion that women had to go through. Some of them, so I'm going to recount some of the restrictions that were already happening starting as early as the 70s, 80s, 90s, and actually there was a um, spike on restrictions um, during the Obama years, not because of President Obama, but because um, a lot of states became a lot more conservative than they were. So some of the restrictions I'll let you know about, so ultrasound, so once the person, once the pregnant individual made the decision to make, to have an abortion, they would go to their provider and then they would be forced to have an ultrasound even though they made the decision already. And in many states, they are forced to view the ultrasound and to hear the provider recount how is, what is it that they're looking at the ultrasound while doing the ultrasound. So what does this mean? They want to stigmatize women. They want to traumatize women. The other, other laws that are in, have been in the books before the Dobbs decision. The requirement that abortion providers relay false information to their patients, like the fact that abortion causes breast cancer, which is not true, has been by many scientific studies has been you know, proved to be false. Some states introduce recent bans, recent bans like they're gonna prohibit abortion because of a person, of the fetus's sex or the race or their disability. This is not a reason why women get abortions. They get abortions because they cannot afford having another child, because they're not at a moment in their lives when, whether to have an abortion. It's not because to have a pregnancy. It's not because it's going to be a male or it's going to be a person with disability or it's going to be a person that is of a certain race. And organizations representing the interests of people with disabilities, um, communities of colors, have long denounced this tactic. Other restrictions are waiting periods. So what does this mean? It means that once a person has, a pregnant individual has a first encounter with a provider, they have to have the first counseling and then they have to wait 24, 48, 72 hours in order to have the abortion. So what did that mean? That meant that individuals, and because there have been abortion deserts in states like Idaho, in states like Alabama, in the South, then a lot of those folks had to go from one state to another in order to have abortion, drive or take flights of as far as 300 miles. So what did that mean? That meant that this person had to leave their family, get money in order to travel, get lodging costs, 
go to see the provider, wait another one, two, three days in order to actually have the procedure. So this types of laws made it extremely difficult for people to have abortions. And again, the number one reason why women have abortions is because they cannot afford to have one child or another child. Other ways that abortions were restricted through gestational bans, restricting um, abortions at the 6, 10, 15 week mark, way before women knew that they were pregnant. And so when, once you find out that you're pregnant and you make the decision to have an abortion, it might be too late. Also because there are not a lot of abortion providers. So it's not like I can just call and say, I wanna see you tomorrow. You need to make an appointment and then depending on that provider's availability, then you had to wait, I don't know, a few weeks to a month in order to have the abortion. The other restriction that I wanna talk about is uh, restriction to access to medication abortion. So for the last 25 years, almost a quarter of a century, the FDA, and I'll talk about a case that um, is currently under review by the Supreme Court, the Food and Drug Administration had approved this drug called Mifepristone. Maybe you have all heard it in the news. This is a drug that's safer than Viagra, that's safer than Tylenol, where a woman can have you know, this drug, mifepristone, as, long, as well as misoprostol, have it in the comfort of her own home and be able to have the abortion, which feels like a heavy period. It's completely safe. It has been available for more than a quarter century all around the world. There have been hundreds of scientific studies confirming its safety. And so because, and now it, um, comprises more than 50% of abortions in the country. So I, I want to say all of this because people have been talking about the return of back alley abortions, and that's not necessarily what would happen because of the availability of medication abortion now. So now, because medication abortion can be shipped to an individual, um, then 17 states have banned the use of telehealth counseling in order to ship the medication abortion. During the COVID-19 uh, public health emergency, tele teleabortions were absolutely life-saving for individuals who could not see providers, for people who just didn't feel comfortable going from one state to another. Also, 33 states ban parental or require parental information and um, consent for minors seeking abortion. I will say that the majority of minors who want to have an abortion consult with their parents. In the very few circumstances in which they don't, it's because the parent abused them or the guardian abuses them or they themselves are the perpetrators or the ones who um, help create the pregnancy. Another restriction, and this was seen at the Supreme Court, is um, these types of laws called targeted regulations against abortion providers. These are called trap laws. So a trap law looks like this. It's a requirement for a clinic to have certain type of lighting or certain types of bedding in order to be an abortion provider. As I just mentioned, abortions can happen via medication, so you don't really need to have a surgical center or a certain type of lighting in order to counsel someone to have a medication abortion. And what did this, what did this result in? The closure of hundreds of abortion clinics, especially in the state of Texas and across the border with Mexico. So these are all the examples of all of the restrictions that we have been having for decades, even before Roe v. Wade was overrule. And I say this because Roe was not enough. If we want to build from what we have right now, which is not a constitutional right to have an abortion, we have to be better about setting the standard for what this healthcare, reproductive healthcare would look like. And so now over the years, with this 500 restrictions, finally with the death of Justice Ruth Gator 
um, Baylor Ginsburg. Now you have a six to three conservative majority um, in the Supreme Court. And they finally took the opportunity to see a case that they didn't have to because it was always cons unconstitutional. So they finally saw this case that had been sitting in the Supreme Court, court for a number of years, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And with that, Justice Alito rule that abortion can no longer be constitutional. He refers to this 1800, um, 1800 laws that I was talking to you about and said, you know what? It's up to the states to decide what a, where they want abortions to look like. And now we're seeing the ramifications, which I will talk a little bit about, of all the mayhem that has caused, that this court has caused, or that this court case has caused, as we can see in Alabama and in other issues that I will talk about. Yeah, so it sounds like once stops comes through, it, it maybe has emboldened the other side and, and said, okay, well, we got that, so now what else can we begin to get at the state level? Um, and so what's, what's kind of now post stops happening in states that, that we can kind of see forecasting like where they're going from now? Yeah, in the wake of the Dobbs decision, a, uh, a lot of states run to either revive the pre-row restrictions on abortions that they have or pass complete abortion restrictions. So at this moment, we have 16 states that don't have, um, that ban abortions completely. As I'm sure you can imagine, and I'll talk about the Alabama case in a moment, this has caused a lot of confusion for providers, for abortion patients, and for the public in general. And yeah, maybe being here in California, you say, this is not gonna happen here, but my experience working as an advocate in this field is that it still creates a chilling effect for people even here or even in the states where there are not abortion restrictions. People think that um, abortion is completely legal. And so now with the 16 states that have complete abortion restrictions and then where there is a lot of litigation happening in so many states and where you have a research tank by the name of the Good Marker Institute finding that maybe half of your states will um, restrict abortions, then that means that women don't have abortions and so they are being forced to have a child against their wishes and against their interests. Um, I will say, and this is again before the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, there was a plethora of research papers demonstrating the catastrophic effects that having, uh, that being forced to have a pregnancy, to carry on a pregnancy, have for women. Uh, one, for their economic security, but also for their physical and mental health um, well-being, as well as for their current children, since the majority of abortion patients are mothers, for their current children and for their future children. Um, there is this study um, called the Turnaway Study that I invite you all to look at by the University of California, San Francisco, that is essentially a combination of a lot of research papers and what these studies have found is that really being denied an abortion not only it causes a detrimental effect for the women and their families, but just communities. Since the Ops v. Jansen Women's Health Organization, a recent study by, the, uh, by John Hopkins University found that in states that have um, abortion restrictions, and, uh, women feel higher rates of anxiety. It is no coincidence that the states that have abortion restrictions, most of which are in the South and in the Midwest, are also the states that have an expanded Medicaid, where there is no investment on healthcare and on education. These are also the states with the highest maternal mortality and morbidity. You were talking earlier about Idaho and the fact that there are no um, maternity wars and reproductive health clinics, we now have abortion providers and reproductive health care providers because they just not offer abortion. They offer all of these types of other um, sexual and reproductive health care services. They're leaving the state, so that means that there are less reproductive health care providers for any other service. And so you have this rise in maternal mortality and morbidity. And, and, and this is, and the numbers of 
black of maternal mortality and morbidity are a lot worse for black and indigenous women. Black and indigenous women die three to four times at higher rates than white women. The United States has the worst maternal mortality, maternal mortality and morbidity rate in the developed world. Things are not going great. And so these abortion restrictions are making it a lot worse. I'll talk about the Alabama case. So as I'm sure you've heard, a couple of weeks ago, the Supreme Court of Alabama revived this, act this um, constitutional amendment that they had passed even before Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization and ruled that embryos cannot, that any um, harm to an embryo means the loss of life that involves legal consequences. What's really, what people are not talking about is that it's actually, this is a case about some couples that went through IVF and unfortunately the clinic where their embryos were being held somehow damaged the embryos. These couples did not seek to go after abortion restrictions. They simply wanted to ask for remedies from the clinic because the clinic did not take care of the embryos properly. I think uh, something happened, I think like a patient, somebody went into the lab and then they dropped the embryos and then that's how they were destroyed. And so, ultra-conservative activists, including members of the judiciary in Alabama, said this will be the, our time to make sure that we are protecting embryos, that we are defining where life begins, and according to them, it begins at, at the moment of conception. And now we're seeing the ramifications, and to be honest with you, everybody's acting as if they're really surprised that this happened, but we have been warning my organizations and my organizations and others have been warning that this is, is what's going to happen. Um, that this is not just, this are not just going to be effects on the right to abortion, but on the right to um, IBF, the right to, um, and the right to contraception. And we are also seeing attacks on LGBTQ people and gender affirming people and gender affirming care. Um, one thing to point out about the Alabama case is I'm sure that you've all heard, well, the state legislature now has introduced a bill, and so IBF is now legal in Alabama. However, Alabama still has this constitutional amendment, this sanctity of life amendment, so they can still bring up a case before the Supreme Court because they have this constitutional amendment, and so... Uh, they have created this false expectation that actually IBF patients and providers are secure in Alabama. I can say that as a former IBF patient, I conceived my child through IBF, I would not feel comfortable having treatment in a state of Al like Alabama or in a state with abortion restrictions. And this is not just an example in the South. Actually, in Texas, we're seeing a similar case moving through the courts. Ohio just introduced a bill similar to what Alabama had. And I'm just going to say some numbers from an organization called Pregnancy Justice, just to illustrate that this is not just, you know, one-off example in Alabama. At least 11 states have extreme broad personhood language. That is, that they define... Uh, the right to life from the moment of conception. At least 27 states include personhood or personhood adjacent language. That is, they protect the right of, quote, an unborn human being, an unborn human individual, dignity of all human life. We saw this language in Justice Alito's opinion in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And 18 states have fit aside laws authorizing homicide charges to be brought by, for causing the loss of a pregnancy. And you're all thinking, this is, this is happening elsewhere. We're not being affected by it. The reality is that three years ago, a woman in Fresno here in California had a stillbirth and she was prosecuted, she was charged, she was arrested for, having, for endangering the life of the child because she had a substance use disorder. 
things happen, you know, be, stillbirths happen, miscarriages happen. Yes, those charges were already, were eventually dropped. My organization and others work with the California Attorney General's office in order to, you know, let this woman free. But the damage was already done. Again, we have all of these laws, and I say this as an attorney, we have all of these protections, but they don't mean anything if it still causes confusion, if law enforcement still goes and wants to arrest people. Let me also talk about a couple of Supreme Court cases that the court is going to see just this turn. We thought that with Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, this, this was going to end things. No. <laughs> the fact is that we're still having you know, a lot of litigation, not only at the state level, but we're seeing in the Supreme Court. Later this month, the Supreme Court is going to look at this case called Alliance for Hippo um, Hippocratic Medicine versus the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Remember, I talked about medication abortion and the fact that it, ha it has been available for almost 25 years, that it's fully safe. Well, a new organization was created in Amarillo, Texas, that... Uh, of anti-abortion activists, they brought this case before this judge called, um, I don't remember his first name, but his last name is Kaczmarek, this anti-abortion judge. And then they said, you know what? The U.S. Food and Drug Administration, an organization of scientific experts, erred more than 25 years ago by saying that um, mifepristone, this me uh, medication abortion drug, should, um, could be approved. Um, and they're also saying, you know, the Food and Drug Administration erred in allowing the shipment of medication abortion, and it erred in allowing pharmacies more recently, a couple of years ago, to be able to dispense medication abortion. This will be absolutely catastrophic. If medication abortion went to go away, that means that over 50%, you know, I think the number right now is that 55% of abortions would not be available even in states like California. So even in states like California, and I talk a little bit about some of the really great um, victories that we've had, especially in the last couple of years, that has all of these protections. Now we're seeing all of these, um, you know, the, these medications become unavailable even in our states. Um, so please pay attention to that Supreme Court case. The other one is Idaho versus the United States. Let me give you some background. This is, a, this is about a law called EMTALA, which was passed in the 1980s. It stands for Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act. This is a law that requires any hospital that receives federal funding to never deny any person who's about to die in a hospital. If you're about to die, regardless of your insurance status, who you are, documentation status, a hospital should be able to see you. And why was this law introduced in the 1980s? Because a lot of hospitals were turning people away because they didn't have health insurance. So obviously, in order to sometimes save the life of a pregnant person, sometimes that person needs to get an abortion, right? Um, a person is having a life in danger, you know, a ectopic pregnancy, a miscarriage, is go an accident happened. Obviously, that fetus is not going to survive. This woman needs to survive. And so Mtala tells the hospital, you have to take care of her. Even if abortion is not legal in your state, you are required by federal law to do anything in your power to keep this person alive. A couple of years ago, or soon after Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization was ruled, the federal government clarified that abortion is a stabilizing treatment. A couple of months later, Idaho enacts a full abortion ban without any exceptions to life endangerment, and then the federal government sues Idaho, and it says you must have a life endangerment situation. The hospitals in Idaho should be required to provide treatment if a pregnant person's life is in danger, and essentially um, 
you know, it's this case has been worked out, you know, worked up through the courts. And at this moment, Idaho hospitals cannot provide a stabilizing treatment to a pregnant individual. And um, the case will be heard on April 24th. So all of this to say that it has caught, to say that this has caused confusion and chaos is, you know, it's like it's a misnomer. It's caused a, a crisis, a healthcare crisis, um, a lot of confusion. We're already seeing studies about causing anxiety. We're already seeing studies about in cases in states like Texas, where um, maternal, where there are a lot more pregnancies. There are a lot more pregnancies among young women, uh, where hospitals are being you know, flooded. Um, So um, it it hasn't been good. And unfortunately, not only has this caused, you know, terrible things to people, but attorneys are really, really busy litigating in various courts and just trying to clarify whatever protections we can have at the state level. So I I feel kind of the need to just like um, take a deep breath because that is depressing. Um, and, and angering, um, especially because it seems I, I'm going off book a little bit. Yeah, here. Um, the, the Alabama ruling that sort of where the legislature comes through and clarifies, no, no, we want IVF. That seems to privilege more people who are capable of affording IVF treatments. We're still then punishing those who are impoverished. Um, and so now they're kind of creating a, a class differential, um, as well, um, do you see that happening in, in other places as well, where it's, it's privileging those who may be able to afford you know, IVF or other treatments, but still keeping those who um, you know, couldn't afford abortions or whatever kind of at bay? Yeah. I mean, it becomes as, mu- as much of a gender issue as it does a, a class issue, too. Yeah, reprodu- access to reproductive health is always, has always been a class issue. I should, and of course, I, I think like even if they're saying you can go ahead and do IBF, that doesn't mean that IBF is being covered. As someone who went through IBF myself, it costs dozens of thousands of dollars in order to have IBF. I cannot imagine what it would be like to say from one moment, you know, you go through the grief of not being able to procreate. You go through the grief of going through all of these different tests and then from one moment to another say, no, you cannot have access to this treatment. It's absolutely horrendous. I should also emphasize that Medicaid has never covered IVF treatment, which also becomes a disparity. So yes, I mean, it's, it's interesting that the legislature, even though it doesn't fully protect, move quickly to protect the rights of all of the you know, privileged people who are able to cover the service never, and at the same time, restrict access to abortion, and at the same time, not provide health care, not provide, not expand Medicaid for adults, right? Alabama does not only um, gives Medicaid coverage for certain types of people. It doesn't do it for all other types of people. They don't have sex education. So yes, um, all of the laws are meant to protect white privilege, um, you know, straight people. That has been the history of our healthcare system, frankly, and abortion access and IBF access in no, is no exception. Um, yeah. Priscilla? What role has religion played? You know, when I was growing up, I thought it was just Catholics who said no, you can't have an abortion. Yeah. Well, it's I would say that a lot of them are fundamentalist evangelicals. Um, I I do think that Catholics and myself being one of them have certainly have played a role in advancing um, this anti-choice, anti-abortion laws. Um, what is really unfortunate is that you know, and I can talk about it in a little bit, is that this fundamentalist 
primarily Christians that are moving forward this loss at the state level, in particular in the South, do not speak for the majority of religious people. They certainly don't speak for the majority of Catholics that actually approve the right to abortion and the majority of Americans that support Roe v. Wade, that support abortion. Um, I think that there are there is a role that a lot of religious communities have played. Um, Presbyterians, I've worked, been in coalitions with Presbyterian um, church leaders, um, Unitarian Universalist organizations, um, some Methodists have also been involved. So um, unfortunately, it has been fundamentalists with a lot of power and a lot of resources who have really been behind a lot of state legislators who have advanced these types of laws. And, and I just got some um, information from uh, PRRI, uh, which is a research firm, um, and they came out with some uh, data recently that said uh, there's only two major religious groups who have majorities who oppose legalizing abortion. Uh, and those two major religious groups are white evangelical Protestants and Hispanic, Pro Hispanic Protestants. Uh, everyone else has less than a majority uh, that want it. And, and um, combined, um, those groups represent only about one in five Americans. And so it is, it is across the board in uh, just about any demographic other than these two, um, most people favor abortion access um, in, in some form to be codified by law. Um, and I mean, even in those groups uh, with white uh, evangelical Protestants, um, only 17% say it should be illegal in all cases. And so even in that big group, some would say, well, in certain cases, um, life of the mother, rape or incest, abortion should be legal. And so, um, so yeah, it's this very narrow band of people uh, who hold very conservative views that are kind of enforcing that and, and sending it through the courts. Um, um, okay, so um, give me a little bit of hope. <laughs> yeah. what's, what's good that is happening? What's yeah. some of the work that, that you are doing and your colleagues are doing to help to, um, if, if not move uh, move forward than to at least withstand the, the continued oppression. Yeah, yeah. I think that we have done really great things in California and states like Oregon and New York and Illinois and Washington. Um, so uh, let me say that you know, abortion has been... Um, has become extremely popular, which is really interesting after the DOPS versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, even though a lot of state legislators have moved to further restrict abortion, the popularity of abortion has increased and we have been able to make really great strides in a lot of states. I mentioned before, and this is even before DOPS, California was one of 17 states that gave funding for Medicaid beneficiaries to cover abortions. California is also one of eight states that require health plans to cover abortions um, for all of their enrollees. So we do have those protections. A couple of years ago, if you might remember, um, the state of California uh, approved Proposition 1, which um, added uh, the right to abortion and contraception in our constitution. We were very much involved in that proposition. Other states are doing the same. And even states like Kansas, like Ohio, are saying, are up, you, know, you, can see, you can see that even the population there um, are including in the ballot their approval to the right to abortion. Um, in 2021, around 40 organizations, including 200 individuals here in California, formed the California Future of Abortion Council. Uh, Governor Gavin Newsom appointed some organizations to put together policy recommendations that would make our state a haven for abortion access. Uh, I am proud to say that we were able to secure more than $230 million to improve abortion access in the state. And we passed almost 20 state laws in addition to some of the 
protections that we had. So some of the uh, protections that we were able to do are the following. We were able to protect providers uh, when patients from out of state came to California to get an abortion so that they wouldn't be prosecuted for giving abortions that are legal here when those abortion patients went back to their um, to their states. We have also included um, past laws to prevent the disclosure of patients' medical records. So again, someone who comes from out of California, we have a lot of Idaho residents who come to states like Oregon and California to get abortions. Those folks' records are being sealed. We're giving funding to abortion providers. So while there has been a plateau in terms of abortion access and stops versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, actually California has seen an increase of abortion patients coming from Texas, coming from the South. And so remember I said the reason why so many women have access to abortion is because they cannot afford it. Once they make the trek to come to California, were able to pay for their abortions, which is phenomenal. We're also funding practical support services. So for those who are coming who don't have the resources, we pay for their lodging and we're paying for their transportation. We also created an abortion website that is being uh, maintained by the California government so that we're able to clarify to people that abortion is legal here and here are the resources and here's where you can get education. We're training abortion providers and medical students. One thing, because of all of this stigma in the medical profession for because of, for abortion providers, not a lot of medical students want to provide abortion services. And who can blame them? They have to go through all of these hurdles to have, you know, they have all of these laws. In addition, one of the things that I didn't talk about is the fact that abortion providers have to have, clinics have to have security because they're constantly under threat, because they're being shot at. I don't know if you remember the clinic in Colorado where there was violence, there was, uh, you know, uh, an, uh, actually an abortion doctor who was attending church was once shot at. This is uh, Dr. Tiller, who used to be a very in, a religious man, was shot outside of his church. So we are offering additional security measures for abortion clinics. We're also offering scholarships for those who want to go to medical schools and want to become abortion providers. Also, not just doctors can provide abortions. Nurse midwives can provide abortions. Physician assistants can provide abortions. So we're opening or widening the scope of practice so that more medical professionals can offer abortions. We're protecting patients. As I mentioned before, we had um, this woman in Fresno who was wrongly detained because she had a stillbirth. So we are working very closely with the state attorney general to make sure that that no longer happens. And regardless of the pregnancy outcome, a person never in California will be charged for losing the pregnancy. We also, there are also situations where pregnant people, especially those who self-managed abortion are going to be might be prosecuted. So we're establishing laws in California to make sure that they don't. One of the laws that my organization um, wor worked on was we removed cost sharing for abortion services. So that means that if you're insured, you don't have to pay a deductible, you don't have to meet a deductible, you don't have to meet a copay, the, your plan should cover abortion fully. We're also funding community-based organizations that prov are providing sex education and other reproductive health care education and that are working with um, underserved communities like immigrants, black um, populations, populations experiencing homelessness, foster youth, etc. So, and this is just an example of some of the things that we're doing here in California and that other states are also doing. Um, I think in my wildest dreams, while, you know, it's w wild to know that Roe v. Wade was reversing my lifetime, I would have never thought that I could be 
in a state where an abortion can be completely covered, where a woman can self-manage her abortion without the fear of persecution, where we have all of this money, more than $200 million, to make sure that providers are safe, that providers have the education, that people have education, that they're being served. So this is going to have an immense impact for our future here. Well, I, I think that um, you know part of the part of the question then of, of seeing how things can go forward is um, what it, it's sort of expected that okay, well, it's the religious people who are who are um, you know being the oppressors here, um, but you kind of reference that that's not entirely the case, and so there are some religious communities who are taking a lead uh, in this way, and so can you talk a little bit about some some of the religious communities that are helping uh, to see access to abortions. Yeah, yeah, and I would say that the religious, a lot of members of the religious community have been with us as soon as Roe v. Wade was, um, was held by the Supreme Court. And even before so, um, you know, as, a, as also a spiritual religious person, my drive for social justice and to defend everyone's right to have health care and to have a dignified life comes from sort of my own spirituality. And I know that that's the case for so many of you. Um, so one um, organization that has existed since 1973, since Roe v. Wade was held, is the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. Um, they are based in Washington, D.C., and they work with a number of denominations, and they issue statements, and they train each other, and they want to understand the reproductive justice framework. And so they have really been the drivers in terms of education educating the religious community, both congregants as well as church leaders, to make sure that they are defending the right to uh, be a person and be able to have your bodily autonomy. Um, the Universal Unitarian Church has also issued statements, filed amicus briefs. National Council of Jewish Women have also been very strong allies and conspirators. Um, so we have, there is definitely, like, like as we were mentioning earlier, there's definitely a plethora of religious denominations that have been with us and that unfortunately, for one reason or another, maybe they're not getting the... Um, attention in the media. Maybe they don't have the type of resources that others do, especially with state legislators and governors, that we're not seeing all of the great things that they're doing. Um, I also used to um, volunteer, actually, with an organization called All Options that provides compassionate counseling for people seeking um, abortion services. They have this program called Faith Out Loud, where the clergy speak with women who are trying to consider abortion, they may or may not have it. And a lot of that counseling is based on their religious um, convictions. There are also state-based organizations like, um, I think it's Faith Choice, Ohio, Faith Choice Ohio, the Hasa Podcast, that again uses their spiritual and religious convictions to advocate for access to reproductive health. I'll go a little bit of script, uh, script to just to say, yes, of course, the religious community has been, well, been with us. Yes, of course, this is a human right. I think part of what explains why the, you know, this small group of fundamentalists, you know, evangelicals have such a long, you know, have a, such a strong power of the state legislators is frankly because and um, forgive me for being a little bit partisan, but really abortion, I mean, while abortion is obviously a very important issue, it's an issue of bodily autonomy, it's an economic justice issue, it's a reproductive justice issue, they're using this as a way to divide us, right? They're using this as a way to say, 
uh, you cannot vote for Democrats or you cannot vote for progressive. They're using this as a way to really um, attack people's dignity and autonomy because they don't have any other solutions for which to, you know, they cannot like advocate for education, they cannot advocate for housing, they cannot uh, advocate for healthcare. And so the one way in which they feel they can split people's votes and like you know, touch on people and instill fear in people is by talking about abortion. Again, the majority of the U.S. population supports the right to abortion, supports Roe v. Wade. If anything, it becomes more popular. So it really does baffle me how in the midst of so much support, we're still seeing all of these restrictions. And so to me, also, this is this has a lot to do with where our democracy stands now, right? And how laws are being past now. And so I think that's, that's very um, at the heart of this issue. It's, it, it's the fact that a very small minority is making decisions on a number of issues, including abortion, for the rest of the population that the, the rest of the population doesn't believe in. Yeah, and I think that, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I, most of the crowd here knows, grew up very rural, very conservative East Texas. Um, in a fundamentalist kind of evangelical church uh, that was sort of the single issue voter reality of, of this is the cause that you choose who you vote for. Um, and, you know, so, so I've, had, I've had a bit of a, of a move away from that mentality um, and out of sort of the, the pro-life camp and into the pro-choice camp um, via religious conviction. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, we'll go off book a little bit, but but I'm I'm interested in in you know as as someone who has um, spiritual inclinations that's informing the work that you're doing. Um, what do you see as as you know the conviction to do this kind of work? Because I think that you know the work that you're doing requires deep wells of hope and energy and perseverance and all these yeah. like, you know, things I would call as, you know, spiritual gifts. Yeah. Um, and so, the, so I would imagine that it's coming from something um, deep in you about justice and, 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 and advocacy. And so what is it that's informing your, your kind of passion in this um, from a, um, you know, spiritual conviction kind of way. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, we were talking about it earlier, um, just my belief in human rights and my belief in social justice and my belief that everyone should have a dignified life and be able to decide how they want to get to the dignified life. Um, I think all of these issues, you know, I came into working on reproductive justice because... I lived under a civil war in my country where indigenous women were sterilized against their will. Um, and, and so, you know, slowly I was, you know, I, was, I was looking at that, I was, you know, knowing that this was happening at the same time that all of these restrictions on abortion were happening. You know, abortion is still completely illegal in my country. And so... A, per, a woman's right to choose over her body, a woman's right to choose to have some sort of health care, to be able to plan her family is fundamental to her development and to and fundamental to the well-being of her family and her community. And so for me, my belief in God, my belief in my spirituality, you know, uh, one of I, I've I've talked to um I've had the opportunity when I was working in Latin America, working with um, Católicas por el Derecho de Decidir, which is Catholics for the Right to Decide. It's sort of the Latin American version of Catholics for Choice. And I will never, um, you know, I will always remember this conversation with this activist who was telling me, look, even the Virgin Mary was given a right to choose, right? Like in our belief, in, in our religion, uh, you know, Archangel Michael came to the Virgin Mary and said, would you like to have God's child? And then, then she said, yes, <laughs> right? And so if the Virgin Mary had the ability to choose, why can I, right? Why can I? Why can I have the ability to choose? Why can I decide over what's going to happen with my family, right? Why can I 
be able, you know, since I went through IBF, have the ability to, thanks to science, be able to have a baby and create my family. You know, I trust what women say. I trust how they, you know, the decisions that they make. And so in order to have an abortion, let me just say that you don't need an excuse to have an abortion. You, you should have an abortion if you decide to have an abortion. My experience, given my religious conviction and also as someone who volunteered listening to people, by listening to women who wanted to have abortion is that you think about this. You think about your well-being. You think about, am I going to be able to provide for my children? You think about, I'm going to be able to become a professional. And so I trust that. Um, and, and now, um, you know, scientific studies do prove like what my, my conviction, right? They do prove you're better, you feel better, your children feel better, you know, you, you made this decision, you're later gonna be able to procreate. So, and I also wanna offer compassion to people, right? And so the ability to have choice, you know, to choose and the ability to form your family in an, it's an inextricably linked to the right to have housing and the right to have education and the right to have health care. Like I said, when I have traveled throughout the world doing advocacy, doing international law, absolutely everyone has an abortion. It's not unique to the United States. It's not unique to the 1970s. I'll, I'll end my intervention by saying that one out of four women in the United States will have an abortion in their lifetime. And as activist Renee Bracey Sherman says, everyone loves someone who's had an abortion. And so at the very core, my very, you know, my value as a human being and as an activist is love. And so I love people who have abortions. And so I cannot condemn, I cannot judge, I cannot not be compassionate with someone who will have an abortion or has had an abortion. Thank you, that's yeah, beautifully said. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's worth it. You know. <laughs> we'll put you up there next time now. Uh, <laughs> um, kind of final question and then, and then we'll, we'll ask the audience, but um, You've devoted your life and career and, and intellect and passion to this, um, and not everyone here uh, has or can, but certainly there's probably something that we could do. And so what, what are some things that you can say, you know, just anybody uh, who cares about this issue can do to help make it a little bit better? Yeah, just talk about it. It's nothing bad. You can say the word abortion. You know, maybe you've had an abortion. Maybe you know someone who's had an abortion. Have those conversations with people. What was it like? How do you, you know, just, just normalize it. I look forward to having that conversation with my baby, right? At some point where he grows up. And so it's okay. It's fine. It's part of life. Just like birthing a child or like using contraception. That's the number one thing. Obviously, educating yourselves, having meetings like this one, going to our abortion website, um, go, uh, seeing magazines, reading magazines like Rewire, educating yourselves, like going to the Goodmacher Institute website, which has a lot of studies. Um, I think that's the very low lift. What other congregations have done is they've issued statements, they filed amicus briefs, they've provided compassionate care for people considering abortions. Uh, there is so much that you can do. Um, one of the frameworks that I invite you all to, that's really inspired my work that I invite you all to learn about is the term reproductive justice, which this year turns 30. Reproductive justice is a framework developed by black women who felt that all of the conversations around abortion did not consider other issues that were important for themselves and for the communities and for everyone, right? So reproductive justice means the right to have or not have a child, the right to plan your child, and the right to have a child in a safe and dignified community. So 
Reproductive justice includes the right to abortion. It includes the right to safe housing. It includes the right to safety. Um, Black, I, I, I think that you um, commemorated Black History Month last, last month, right? You understand the over-criminalization that Black and Brown people go through and what that effect will have in wanting to have a child, right? Uh, what is it, and, and these are all issues that are inextricably linked, right? Like over-criminalization, where does it happen in states that haven't expanded Medicaid, in states that don't respond to the issues of, home, of people experiencing homelessness, in people with high maternal mortality and morbidity. And so I think when you think about these issues, you can think about them holistically. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, if, if there's questions, I know Rose, you were you were wanting to ask, and um, do we need this or can you just yell? You just yell, okay. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I'm really glad that you brought that question because, so Roe v. Wade was based out of the right to, you know, it was held that it was constitutional out of the right to privacy. And many people, including myself, while obviously we support the right to abortion, don't believe that necessarily the right to privacy was the best um, legal basis in which to find the right to abortion. I believe that um, the, men, the Equal Protection Clause in the U.S. Constitution will provide a better protection just because the right to abortion is about the right of women to have equal access to the law. It's not just about the right to privacy, even though it is a really private decision. Most women have abortions in consultation with their partners, thinking about their children. So I think that there is a real opportunity to rebuild a better, better case law that defends the right to abortion. I also think, you know, I, I always say that I'm be, I, I get paid to be an optimist. So hopefully in the next, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, we see a federal right that is passed by U.S. Congress that protects the right to abortion and that doesn't have restrictions like the Hyde Amendment, which I spoke about, which are restrictions on coverage of abortion, because a law doesn't mean anything unless it is accessible to everyone. So I think by passing a federal statute and by having better constitutional grounds, I think that we can really get there. And we have, I mean, you know, thinking about um, religious background, Ireland, right, a very Catholic country, was able to have, was able to pass a few years ago the right to abortion in their constitution. And not only are they, um, or not in their constitution, France is actually the first one that intru has introduced a constitutional amendment, but to have a federal prote or a uh, national protection to the right to abortion. So Ireland, not only does it have this legal protection, but in Ireland, any woman can go to a, a state hospital or a public hospital and get their abortions covered. So I think that that would be really the gold standard. The Equal Protection Clause under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. It's a better, and actually that is an argument that um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg made um, that while obviously she supported the right to abortion, that maybe the right to privacy was not the best basis in which to hold this right, just because it's weak. As we saw, though I have to say, it's not necessarily because of the right to privacy that we lost the right to abortion. It's really the composition of the Supreme Court and all of these other restrictions that were happening at the state level that eventually made their way to the Supreme Court. Any other questions? 
Susie? Mine's more of a comment. Um, I did IVF in the 1980s, and I was forced to make a pretty mature decision on my embryos based on financial economic. Um, you had to make a decision because you couldn't afford storage of your frozen embryos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, I think there is a lot to be done um, just around IBF. Like I mentioned, uh, IBF is not generally covered by health insurance, definitely not covered by Medicaid. Myself, my husband and I had to make great sacrifices, even as public interest attorneys in order to have IBF. and. IBF is not just like a procedure that you just go to and you get it. There are so many steps that you need to go through and it's not one, two, three, four, five. It's like one, 1 1.5, you go back to one, uh, even now. So um, it's really unfortunate that even uh, as much of a headway as we have made scientifically, uh, that that right is now, it, could be even worse and it's gonna be even worse in state. So thank you for sharing your story as well. Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Yeah, or even years, I, you know, I was in IBF support groups and heard stories of people refinancing their homes in order to afford IBF. Um, we got relatively lucky in that we did it after three tries, but it, yeah, it was, it, it's not a pleasant journey. It took us years, um, even when I was educated, even when I made the decision, even with all of these factors. And so, yeah, people in my support group have been trying to conceive for five, 10 years. And so to lose, you know, to finally be able to come up with the resources and finding a provider, and then I can only imagine what it must have been like to have been a couple trying to go through IVF in Alabama and to just from one moment to another, all of your hopes, all of the sacrifices that you made go away. It just must be horrific to an already very traumatic experience. I have not heard of anyone going through IVF saying that was easy, that was great. <laughs> it's really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's where I come from in, in kind of thinking about this issue, you know, ethically and, and religiously is the kind of trauma that is experienced in, uh, in denying people their dignity and their kind of capacity to be image bearers of God, but not enough to choose. Um, and, and then so, so that, and then you, you see how, how the overwhelming kind of cascading effects that it has in communities in general, but then in marginalized communities specifically. Um, you know, just, just thinking about the, the IVF decision, I'm sure there's a chilling effect in places beyond Alabama of, of like, well, what happens if yeah. my state chooses this? Maybe we don't choose this as an option for our family. Um, 
And so, so just, you know, healthcare in general now is suffering because of this issue now in the past couple of years. Um, and so I, I, see, I see it connected to justice. I really appreciate you kind of outlining what reproductive justice, you know, kind of the pillars of that and, and how it's been, it's more than just abortion access. Um, and so we can work in this as if, if working in justice is going to touch this no matter what. Um, any other questions that, that y'all had? Um, we, we, yeah, yeah, I mean, um, I talked about the two Supreme Court cases. I think I'm really scared for both of them. I'm really scared for what's going to happen to medication abortion, even in states like California. So all of the great accomplishments that we made here means that even us, even when we decided we passed a constitutional amendment, we passed a proposition, and the federal government still doesn't want us to have access to medication abortion. I'm really scared about the second case, Idaho versus United States, and what that would mean for women literally dying um, because they don't want to terminate the preg a pregnancy that would endanger their life. So that's what's coming up in the next few months. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm terrified of, um, the next, of an administration that's different from the one that we have now. Um, they released a document ca called Project 225, um, that ha and they've said that they want to have a national ban on abortion and other terrible things that's been introduced by the Heritage Foundation. It's going to be worse than uh, the prior years because now they're more emboldened, they know what they're doing, and these are people who are experts. The person who wrote, just to give you an example of, you know, the chapter on how they're going to manage healthcare, is the former um, leader of the HHS, of the U.S. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights. So, uh, yeah, we're we're terrified because it's not. If a new administration comes along, they're going to do a lot more damage than they did before. Where's the money coming from for all of this push? Is there any clear source of the funding for this radicalization of our healthcare? Yeah. Um, it's called the Heritage Foundation. And the Heritage corporations because it ties with their ability oh it's such a hard question to ask I mean I think it ties with their ability to do as they please with a state and federal legislators. It comes, I mean, it's no coincidence that a lot of corporations have very close ties to fundamentalist Christian churches. Um, is, you know, the same people who are, want to reject or the right to abortion are the same people that don't want environmental protections, right? These are all, these are all kind of the same people or are the same people. One of the things that is really terrifying, you as a scientist will appreciate this, um, they want to get rid of government agencies. They want to get rid of experts, right? Right now, they're battling the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, for goodness sake, and they're saying, no, you shouldn't have ruled that this new, um, that this drug that has been existing for 25 years should have been available in the market. What is going to be the ramification for other prescription drugs, right? So it's, it can be pharma that's really behind it, right? They want to make sure that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration is, you know, able to, is going to be able to process the drugs that they want to process, right? So, yeah, the money is coming from, from 
corporations is coming from well-resourced fundamentalist churches that do provide that type of, you know, lobbying support to all of the state legislators, right, that are able to fund their lobbying activities. If you if you feel like getting really depressed, there's an article in the Texas Monthly from last month that outlines um, a guy in Midland, uh, Tim Dunn, I believe, a billionaire oil man who also happens to be a prominent person in his church. He has enough money where um, he gives a scorecard to every legislature. If you don't pass his thing, he will primary you and drop quarter million dollars in the middle of nowhere. Their opponent can never get that much money. Now, now you've lost, and so you either vote his way or he will make you lose your job. And well, this guy, um, this guy specifically uh, became so wealthy that he was like, "I'm going to start my own church," and um, uh, it draws other people because he he tells them what they want, um, but he doesn't need their money. He's more interested in their power and and you know absorbing all that. He he's created a little compound with his family. Uh, outside of Midland, um, and so now it's this like generational thing, um, and so I, I think that that what you see, you know, to, so to me, seeing like what's happening in Alabama with with IVF and how they they now will the legislatures will will actually undermine their argument in order to make constituents happy who have money to to fund them. Um, you see that happening is that they'll undermine their argument or they'll pay less attention to you know, certain scripture or, or, or convictions. Um, and then you'll have people who will actually, I mean, in short, sell their soul in order to gain money or power or influence. Um, and so uh, I think that that's a, that's a, a very kind of appealing way that, that the fundamentalist circles work is, um, I, you see this in, in you know, the, the crisis across, for example, the Southern Baptists um, and others who are, uh, who have been hiding um, sexual abuse throughout uh, throughout their their ministry um, that's happening because it's a way of consolidating power and so um, yeah it's terrifying um. can I also say now that you know um the Catholic Church has really, definitely have a huge role. You know, you were talking about sexual abuse. I said, oh, yes, Catholics have definitely <laughs> have done a lot of harm there. One thing that's really interesting that even happens here in, in California is that one out of five hospitals are owned by the Catholic Church, right? So we have a healthcare system that's owned by Catholics, right? They're making money out of this. They don't pay taxes. They also have, and they're also the movement largely behind the chartering of schools, right? So they receive all of this funding for their own schools. So they have this very intricate system where they're building and building and building wealth through church, uh, through hospitals, through schools, essentially appointing whoever they want, you know, to be in power, partnering with corporate, you know, with from huge corporations. And so they have the system where they have their own legislatures, right? And who consequently, these legislatures um, create mapping districts, right? That, if, that also has ramifications on the composition of, uh, you know, the United States. On the, the United States um, House of Representatives and, se and Senate. And so that's why I was talking about that there is this, at the core of all of these issues, there is very much this question of what is this democracy? Like what is happening now that the very few people have so much power over people, over the rest of the United States and reproductive health care and health care access is definitely not the exception, but one of the biggest ways in which we, we're seeing this dynamics unfold. Saturday yeah. night. Yes. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so what I, what I hope and the reason, the reason, like I said, that I wanted to host this conversation during this month is because what, what we are seeing is that when women are marginalized in our society, that it has massive effects across the community. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I remember a few years ago, um, 
I was, I was raised by a strong woman, uh, by strong women in my life, both mother and grandmother. Uh, they were the bosses. Um, they did um, a hell of a job doing the work that they had to do. Um, I hope I'm raising strong girls um, who are willing to recognize um, that, that treating women as less than, especially women of color uh, or uh, transgender women as less than uh, has uh, a poisoning effect across society. And so I hope that by lifting this conversation up and making it central, um, that it allows us to be more attentive to um, kind of what's happening um, at a distance. This touches so many other things. And so I thank you for taking the time. Can we, can we hear uh, some, a round of applause for Fabiola Carrion for sharing with us? Um, I want to invite you, we have some snacks and stuff out in the, in the foyer here, and so if you'd like to kind of hang around and talk with one another, or at least, you know, uh, cry into your cup of coffee, uh, you can do that too. Uh, but thank you for, for joining us this evening.